um, advances in molecular biology um, that has been developed in the late 1980s and early 1990s have led to the recognition of various other um, particles or um, structures that can cause diseases. And this particular chapter is based on uh, such uh, particles or um, uh, extracellular structures. So we'll look at uh, all these three. Um, there are mainly three viruses, viroids and prions, and we will understand each one of them. So let's look at the first one, which is what are viruses? Um, viruses um, are firstly very, very small in comparison to the size of a bacteria. So in this picture over here where I'm pointing to the arrow, you can see this is the E. coli, which is the, uh, which is a bacterium, um, a gram negative rod. And, uh, compared to that, here are some of the viruses that are shown to you. Bacteriophage is the virus that attaches, uh, or it, it, um, attacks a bacteria. Adenovirus, um, poliovirus, prions, um, vaccinia, tobacco mosaic virus, rhinovirus, and viroids, and Ebola virus. So you can see all these, um, uh, all these are um, very small structures in size. And uh, one, uh, you know, these um, are sub uh, microscopic particles that it was very difficult to even um, imagine their size. Um, by the and by the late 1930s, um, scientists had begun using the word virus, uh, which uh, is derived from a Latin root, and it is word to describe um, something that's poisonous or something that could uh, filterable agents. Pretty much, that's what it was. One of the earliest viruses that was uh, discovered was a tobacco mosaic virus. Um, and uh, it was iso actually isolated uh, by Wendell Stanley, an American chemist. Um, viruses are very in interesting that because viruses are um, um, uh, are not living outside the cell, so it's a very ambiguous answer when somebody if you, if it's asked whether viruses are living or not, because viruses by themselves cannot live outside a host cell. However, once a virus enters a host cell, um, the viral nucleic acid will become very active and the viral can multiply and it will cause diseases while living in the host cell. So from a clinical point of view, viruses can be considered act alive when they cause infection and disease and are also considered to be pathogenic um, just like fungi and the protozoa and the bacteria that we've been studying. However, uh, viruses um, are uh, distinguished by other infectious agents, especially because they are obligatory intracellular parasites. That means that that is they absolutely require host living cells um, in order to multiply. However, um, both of these uh, properties are shared by certain small bacteria such as rickettsia uh, viruses. Uh, can be compared to uh, uh, rickettsia, which uh, causes uh, chlamydias, um, because they are um, intracellular parasites. Um, they um, they pass through bacteriological filters, which means that they're so tiny in size that they can pass through many of these filters. Um, they are, uh, as I said, comparatively to the cells uh, size of, of a bacteria, they are very, very small and very tiny. Uh, what are viruses? They generally contain a very simple structure. They contain a genetic material and this genetic material can be either composed of DNA or RNA. They never really have both. So it will either have DNA or RNA. And uh, along with the, with the genetic material, it has something called as uh, a protein coat. A protein coat is the, um, is the, um, um, is pretty much the outside covering uh, that protects the virus 
and um, these are uh, called as um, sometimes they're also called as capsids um, they com- they're composed of lipids uh, carbs and proteins in nature's they will as i said they will not reproduce uh, outside the living cell they always reproduce within the living cells um they use um the host enzymes for all these purposes um and that's why it becomes very difficult to combat um a drug against viruses because any drug that will destroy the virus will have to be destroying the host enzyme also um here are some images of certain viruses for example the polyhedral virus look at the shape um it is a poly a poly uh, uh a geometrical shape then we have the enveloped virus that has a, a capsule and a capsid that I'll talk to you later about it here is a complex virus that can enter a cell and here is a helical virus so um various uh, shapes of the viruses we see over here uh what is the range of a host for a virus um a virus can have um, um can infect uh, um a variety of host but they are very specific for the kind of host that they're working on so um they um that uh, because they are specific on for example um the human papilloma virus will um, 90% of the cases that are caused by cervical cancers are called by h uh, hpv and for example aids is another uh, virus uh, causing disease so uh, this um, this particular feature of combating a certain uh, kinds of cells or a certain region is actually useful for treating the virus um here in this image you can see how a virus can actually um uh can enter a host cell that is on the on the surface of the virus are these uh, receptors um uh, sorry the envel- the spikes and these spikes they match the receptors that are present on the host cell so um they get uh, locked into the receptors and they the receptors are mainly um uh protein and that are present on the the peripheral region of the of the cell membrane um remember there were protein that are trans membrane there are some that can cross the bilipid layer and some that are on the periphery and these peripheral proteins generally form receptors which are which can be uh, which uh, can give signals to the host cells so uh, again what is a viron uh, a, vir- a viron is a term that is used uh, to uh, to um, explain a completely fully developed infectious viral particle that is composed of a nucleic acid uh, which as i said could be dna or rna um and it is surrounded by a protein coat that uh, is called as a capsid and it um, protects it from the environment and is also a vehicle of transmission from one host to the um, to the other um uh, viruses are classified uh, into different uh, uh, categories based on these coats so well, let's go on to the next slide okay this was the one we just did so um here in this picture we can see more examples of other kinds of viruses um okay, viruses that um, that have a a coat um or a capsid uh, is usually covered by an envelope which is a combination of pro- lipid proteins and carbs and some animal viruses are released from the host cell by extrusion process this that con- that coats the virus with a layer of the host uh, plasma membrane that uh, layers and becomes the viral envelope um in many cases the envelope also contains proteins that are determined by the viral nucleic acids or it could be um um derived from the host cells component um besides the envelope um depending on the virus um some of these envelopes may or may not be covered by spikes so here you on this on this particular uh, virus over here that is the um uh, helical virus you can see the spikes that are shown to you in like light blue color and these uh, spikes are Uh, reliable characteristics by which uh, they can be identified as well and for example uh, the influenza virus will clump to the red blood cells and form bridges between them 
Now, there are viruses that uh, do not um, contain um, the envelope, and those are called as the non-enveloped viruses. And the non-enveloped virus, let me, um, we can look at it as uh, this one up here, which is the one in the blue up on the left that you see. It's the polyhedral virus, and that's uh, a non-enveloped virus. So let's look at this shape of the first kind of virus, and this is called as a helical virus. Um, hel helical viruses, as the name tells you, it's going to be very flexible, or it could be rigid too, depending um, on the on the on the on the shape of the rods. Um, they're usually um, a hollow cylindrical uh, capsids that have a helical structure inside, and they, these uh, viruses that uh, that causes rabies and Ebola, hemorrhage, fever, are examples of helical viruses. Uh, a polyhedral viruses are usually um, um viruses that also infect plants um, as well as animals. The capsid of most of these uh, viruses in the shape of a, of a geometrical um, regular uh, polyhedron with many faces and uh, they actually have 12 corners on the, si on the sides if you were to rotate a polyhedral. Um, the, the, each of the surface uh, will have will, what is unique about that is each surface gives you a shape of a triangle. So you can see up here there are shapes of triangle for each surface that you see. Um, and the, one of the good examples for this one is an adenovirus that is shown up here to you. Uh, adenovirus is, is um, <clears throat> another example is a poliovirus that is also uh, polyhedral. Now the next one that I, we want to talk about a little bit up here which we did earlier too is the enveloped virus as you can see the 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 the, the caps the capsomeres um, the nucleic acids are in there then you have the capsomere and then the envelope and then you have the spikes and these spikes actually help them to adhere to a host cell whether it's a blood cell which is given shown to you in this picture um, uh, enveloped viruses um, are also examples of these are the influenza virus and um, the herpes simplex virus. Those are enveloped virus. Um, the last one that you want to look at are the complex virus, and some uh, these um, they have a they almost look like a, um, a star um, um, a space alien or something or a Star Wars ship if you can see how it has the um, it it has the DNA and then it has this protein code and it has these tail fibers, and actually it uses these these tail fibers to adhere to a surface. Um, it's almost like a pin or a, a sheet that can. Uh, poke into um, the host surface, um, and that's how it um, it's uh, it gets into the host cell. Most of the bacteriophages that are the vi the viruses that cause uh, uh, that um, they actually infect uh, bacteria are uh, are these um, bacteriophages are usually these complex phages. Okay. Um, something more about that you need to know about the of the about the viruses is um, the viruses do not really have a specific epithet like we did with uh, the bacterial kingdom or for other classification purposes. Um, most of the name of the viruses usually end with the viridae, for example, adenoviridae, adenoviridae, poxiviridae, herpesviridae. So that's a um, common term that's used for um, for the naming. Um, we're not going to go too much into the naming of uh, of the viruses, but this is just something that you should know. Um, some, uh, what are some of the viruses that you should know? Um, uh, there are some more examples of the most exam important one that we really should know is the HIV virus that causes AIDS. And these are examples of mainly um, all the RNA viruses that are shown to you up here. Um, how are viruses identified? Um, identifying viruses um, 
it's uh, very difficult because the viruses cannot multiply outside a living host cell. So detecting or enumeration and identification um, has to be done within the living cell. Um, living uh, plants and animals are difficult and expensive to maintain. And these pathogenic viruses that grow only in, for example, higher primates and uh, human host um, can cause uh, additional complications to for their uh, detection. Um, however, some viruses that use bacterial cells, for example, the bacteriophages, are easier to grow on bacterial culture. And that's why um, some of the techniques that in involve detection of these are um, use um, serological um, uh, techniques uh, in which which uh, antibodies against the virus in patients are used and um, some of the agglutination tests and western blots are done with uh, for their study we're not going to go um, a whole lot into um, this uh, detection but uh, just some terms to um, to get familiar with So uh, we will um, stop the first part of the virus lecture here and then we'll go on to um, the next slides.